everyone. I um, hope you're seeing me okay. And we're going to start our live cooking demo in about two minutes. I just want to make sure that those who have um, uh, signed up and donated that they have time to sign on and make sure that they can see me. Hi, Amy. How are you? Um, we have four people that donated today, and this is a by donation cooking class. And um, we're also going to be doing a small vinyasa cooking uh, after the cooking demo. So I hope you guys are all ready uh, in your stretchy pants and uh, found our yoga mat. So right after we finish our um, mochi making, we're going to go right into a uh, very soothing and calming, um, exciting to uh, yoga class. So thanks for joining me on a Sunday afternoon. It's not the greatest weather out there, but um, it's not too bad. I'm planning on going for a walk after I teach you guys some green tea mochi. Um, so green tea mochi is actually one of my popular classes that I've um, Hey, Payan, is that how you say it? I'm sorry, I can't really, um, no, I don't think I've met you before. Um, but I'm Renee, uh, I, I run the classes at True Nosh, and um, we're here today, and we're gonna make green tea mochi. Um, along with the mochi, I'm gonna actually also teach you two different fillings. So um, one is a bean filling. If you have beans, you can go ahead and grab some. It can be red beans, it could be kidney beans, whatever beans. I have black beans, so it's not like the, like the usual red bean ones, but I know it's hard to find nowadays. You don't even have to use any stuffing if you don't want to. You can actually put some nuts in or dried fruits in. Um, Payan, okay, great, thanks for uh, uh, correcting me, I'm sorry. Um, that I miss, miss um, smell it. So, but, oh, actually, I think I said it right. Okay, but anyways, and we have Margaret joining. Thanks for joining. Um, I'm really happy that I could do this on a Sunday, and um, I'm very excited. So, um, and we also have Nicole. Thanks for coming, and I miss you all. Missing you all. P P M. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> I'm so sorry again for mispronouncing uh, your name. But um, we're going to start by going um, over our ingredients today. And uh, those who have signed up um, before Friday, you should have gotten an email uh, from me for all the ingredients that we're going to be using today. Um, I'm going to go over them. And if you want to, you can go ahead and grab them from your pantry. Um, so obviously, mochi is... Um, a really exciting dessert. You can find it in Japan, you can find it in Taiwan, you can find it in Hong Kong, a lot of Asian places. So we're, we're getting um, started with some glutinous rice flour. This is gluten-free. So as you can see, it's T-I-N and not T-E-N. And um, there's no wheat, rye, barley whatsoever. It's just the pearly rice. And I'm gonna show you the rice that actually, where it comes from. So in the Asian uh, grocery stores, you can find this type of pearl sweet rice or lo mai in Chinese or no mi, okay? And um, it's chewy and it's sticky. So a lot of people also refer it to sticky rice. Um, and if you can't find the powder, you can actually just buy this type of rice and blend it in a really high speed blender to make a powder and you can still use it the same way, okay? So this is a raw uh, glutinous rice flour and don't, don't get the one that's red or blue, those are completely different flours and make sure you read the, the um, top one says glutinous rice flour. So on to our matcha. I have two types of matcha that I usually have. You can go ahead and buy whatever matcha that you love. Um, I got this in a local tea room. It's called Paragon Tea Room. Shout out to them. They're awesome. If you've never been, they make awesome tea, uh, tea lattes, and uh, they make also their own um, pearls. Or like you know, so you can actually order like a really lovely drink there, and they're on that uh, Canby. And then I also have a friend that does. 
um, and it's called my matcha life. They also do a culinary matcha. You don't actually have to buy culinary matcha as long as you know you like the brand. Go ahead and buy whatever matcha that you like. Okay, we only need about two or three tablespoons. It depends on what you want to do. So I am known to be the queen of um, not using any sugar in my cooking, right? So what I use to um, to uh, substitute the sugar, I use some fruits. So um, you can find whatever fruits you have. I have some pear that I'm going to be using. And in my pantry, there's always some dates. So if you want to go grab some dates or dried uh, raisins, apricots, those are all um, options that you can use to use this as a sweetener, right? And ultimately, mochi is a dessert, and you do want it sweet, but the other ways that we can use um, uh, no sugar is to add some fruits or, or, or dried fruits, right? And then what else? Oh, for the filling. So as I said, we have two different fillings that I'm showing you. You don't even have to fill it. You can just cut them into cubes and eat them after we, we, um, we cook them. So I have some coconut oil here for the black sesame especially. This makes a really good sesame butter. So you don't have black sesame, you can use flax seeds, toast flax seeds. You can also use white sesame. Um, you can even do whatever nuts you want, almonds, cashews, walnuts. Those are also great to make a nut butter. So that's another option. And I have a can of black beans. Um, and then if you don't have black beans, use kidney beans. Also uh, red beans is probably a great match for your green tea. Okay, um, and I'm going to talk about our equipment. We have a mixing bowl with a whisk. I have some water that I measured out. It's about 500 milliliters. Um, I have a scale, but I'm going to show you a trick. If you don't have a scale, don't worry. This is not entirely, um, you know, uh, something that you really need today um, because our package is actually 400 grams and that's something really really awesome to know and in the back here I have a frying pan because I buy black sesame that's raw and I don't like to buy it already toasted because what happens when you buy um, or when you toast something the, the cell walls break and all the yummy oils kind of leach out it's great because it smells really good but you don't want to store it in a warm area especially your kitchen and it can go rancid pretty quickly so I like to buy raw whole sesame and and just toast it myself when I uh, make some lovely uh, sesame paste or uh, filling for my mochi. Um, and then another equipment, if you have a steamer, go, great, you can use this. This is a super Asian thing. Um, Chinese people will definitely have this in your house. Probably you see your mom use it or your grandma. So these are like a three-tier steamer um, pots. And you can put three different layers in which is great um, and if you want to make mochi for all your friends this will be perfect for you to make as many mochis as you can and uh, you don't have to worry but most of us are at home and not many people to feed so we're going to use the small guy so as a, in this case I have a rack like this but if you don't have a rack you can actually just find a big bowl and invert it and then put whatever plate you have on top okay so invert the bowl and right now I'm going to put some water in the bottom okay and you don't really need to put too much water it's about halfway up onto the pot and I'm actually going to turn it on so once we finish making the um, the mochi and it'll be all ready to go and boiling, okay? So I'm gonna turn that on. And if you have anything that you want to um, use as a mold, so you have some pie tins, you can use um, either a metal one or a glass one, it's fine. Or even just a plate that has a little dip inside and that will fit some batter in, you can stick that on and it will like uh, cook really, really fast. So today I'm actually just going to use a, um, a round pie tin. You can use one of the, the square ones um, and you don't have to cut the sides off if you're um, cutting your mochi into squares and using, eating them um, as a snack. 
And the mochis that we're making today, uh, you can keep in a bag with some of the rice flour. Um, you can stick it in the fridge and it should last for one or two days. And if it does get hard, you can actually re-steam it or you can put it in the microwave and um, cook it for about 30 seconds and it should get chewy and soft again. Okay, so um, I'm putting the pan straight onto my steamer and it's already turned on. I'm just waiting for it to boil. It takes a little bit of time to boil. Perfect time for us to come and make our mochi batter. So this is a, um, a recipe that I've um, sort of changed up. I'm sure a lot of you who love to cook and make desserts have seen a lot of YouTube channels on how to make mochi. So, I mean, if you have that recipe, go ahead. This is my version of it. And I, I don't use any sugar, so you can even actually just um, not add sugar. And then the filling inside can be as sweet as possible, right? So it's a little bit healthier. Um, but today, um, I'm going to teach you how to do this. Um, and for the amount of water, for the amount of um, flour we're going to need, um, we're going to be using about uh, 500 mils of water. So you can go ahead and uh, measure out your water. First, your water should be room temperature or cold, right? So don't use hot water in this case. Cold water is the best. If you do use hot water, it will get really gucky and hard to mix. So um, no hot water in this sense. And if you want to get your scale, you can. But if you don't have a scale, so this is a trick that I've learned with our um, North American bags. So in Hong Kong, these bags are actually 600 grams, which is like uh, perfect to actually just cut in half. But today, our, our measurement is about 400 grams here. And if you can see, you can just put this bag on the table and split this into quarters, right? So our recipe calls for 300 grams. Um, and if you kind of take a look, you just kind of karate chop at three quarters of the bag. And this should be relatively 300 grams. And this should be relatively 100 grams, right? It's not really rocket science. It's fine if you doesn't get to the correct 100 grams. I honestly, I've done this recipe with and without a scale and this karate chop um, cheating kind of way to measure it works, okay? So um, obviously if you want to be super exact, just get um, a mixing bowl and tear it and measure out about 300 grams of glutinous rice powder. Okay, that was 200, and I'm going to open a new bag, and measure out another 100. Okay, almost there. And as I said, if you go right two or three grams under, or two or three grams over, it doesn't really matter too much. Um, it should be just fine. So this, the leftover, some of the leftover powder, what you want to do, you want to actually put it um, on a pan and start kind of cooking it um, because it is raw and you, you, it's, well, for people who are not immunocompromised, um, you can just use this raw and it should be fine. We're only really using it to coat the mochi on the outside. Um, so it's not like too crazy if you cook it or not. But um, just for the safe bet, you can um, just put it on a pan and toast it like you would toast any nuts. So what I have here. Um, and then you want to make sure you watch, watch it closely. It does get a little bit brown. Um, if you don't want to toast it on a pan, you can actually just throw this in the oven at about 210 degrees, 250 degrees for about 20 minutes. And then you would shake it in between. So like 10 minutes and then you kind of just shake it and move it around and then another 10 minutes. Um, and then it gets a little bit more brown, like a toasted 
color and you'll know it's done. Okay, so I'm just gonna put it in the back burner on a very low heat. And I'm gonna keep my eye on it. And you'll usually smell a little bit of a toasty um, flavor once it is ready. So you don't have to be, um, you know, watching it that consistently. So what I've done after I toasted, I cooled it down. And I actually, always, I love mint mochi, so I always have like a stash of this powder around. So um, once you have it cooled down, you wanna get a Ziploc bag and you want to put the cooled cooked powder in a bag and you can put the same amount of matcha inside and just like shaking big chicken after you put the matcha inside close the bag really really firmly because all that powder is super um, amazing and you don't want to lose any powder and then you just shake 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 so after you get that done you should have a really nice bag of toasted uh, glutinous rice flour with some mochi, uh, sorry, not mochi, matcha powder inside. And this is what we're going to be using to coat the, the uh, mochi. So you don't have to add the glutinous rice flour. We just have it, you know, as extra. If you don't want to use the, if you don't have enough or you, you know, use it all to make the mochi, you can just actually just sprinkle matcha powder over your, your mochi and that's fine too. Um, the reason I like to mix half and half is because I don't use sugar, right? So if you think about it, drinking matcha straight is super, super bitter. Um, so as a dessert, um, I don't like to have too much um, bitterness in my mochi, so I kind of mixed it in half and half, half glutinous rice powder and half matcha to um, make it less uh, bitter. But if you want to make it even more green, the, the mochi is going to be fine with also just green tea powder. Okay, so let me go and... Finish. This is already boiling. I'm going to turn it to medium so it's not as loud. So I have 300 grams of uh, glutinous rice powder, right? Um, and I have five mil 500 milliliters, so it's about two cups of um, cold or room temperature water. Um, if, if you want to add the matcha now, you should go ahead. So actually, I'm going to open this bag. Um, and this is kind of an important step because matcha is quite hard to um, dissolve in cold water. And if you mix it all in in the glutinous rice powder now, you can um, um, have it mixed into your um, batter a lot easier. So I got these cutesy little measuring uh, spoons. They're in the shape of hearts from one of my best friends in California. I love her to death. Her name's Kathy. Let me say hi to her. She's watching. Um, so I have this is one teaspoon of matcha powder. So um, I'm gonna add a heaping teaspoon. Okay, it doesn't have to be a flat teaspoon. A heaping teaspoon is fine. And then also right now, those of you who want your mochi to be sweet, you're gonna go ahead and add 100 grams of white sugar or coconut sugar, or um, you can add maple syrup to this if you want to, or honey. So um, the measurement is about 100 grams of sugar, and you just want to add it into this um, powder mix, and you're going to whisk it pretty well until all the powder and the green tea have formed a really nice mixture of a light green color. So you don't have to use green tea if you don't like green tea. What other people have done is they've used um, a taro powder, black sesame powder. Yeah, in real person classes that I usually teach at Trunosh, we've actually done green tea mochi along with um, um, black sesame mochi. Um, and other liquids that you can actually substitute for water is coconut milk or um, juice, like apple juice, or you can use actually even mango juice. So if you take the, the green tea out um, and then put in mango juice, and there'll be mango mochi. 
Um, some other people who've taken my class and send me what they've done is they actually made a spicy mochi and they put hot sauce um, in the mixture um, and that's something new. So a lot of um, creativity can go on and once you know the base of the, the, the mochi mix, okay? All right, so after it's all incorporated, <coughs> excuse me, it should look about uh, like a very light green. Um, but you shouldn't be alarmed. It should look a little bit lighter than you would hope at the end because once we um, cook it, the green will come through um, a lot more. Okay, so after it's all mixed in, you can add your water. You can add milk also. You can add almond milk, coconut milk. It's all, all of the liquid goes in at the same time. And you're going to also just whisk, 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 whisk. And if you have any questions, feel free to type it in the chat, or you can email me at info at truenosh.com. Um, also, check out our website, truenosh.com, for uh, any upcoming events. Usually, I try to do one or two lives a week just to, um, you know, have a wider, broader reach of people. Um, and telling people what I do. I am a registered dietitian in uh, Vancouver, BC, Canada, um, and also registered in the US. I um, was uh, a cook and chef in New York for about three years, and then I moved to Hong Kong for another three years. So I have quite a vast uh, experience in um, the uh, culinary and kitchen world. And recently, uh, well actually it's already been my fifth year in Vancouver right now. Five years has gone by so quickly. I can't even say, I think the older you get, the, the years just go by a lot quicker. Um, so I started True Nosh about uh, three and a half, four years ago. Well actually I started it like about four and a half years ago, starting cooking classes in my apartment. And then now we have sort of a, a workshop and I, I go traveling around to think community centers to teach cooking as well. All right, so this is done. And I'm actually just gonna throw this guy in the sink. You don't need it. So we have this that's really a nice mix. It looks like a matcha latte. Um, and that's exactly how it should be. Make sure all the uh, flour and lumps are um, mixed in and you want to go ahead and go and pour it into your um, steamer. So this is a lot of matcha um, and you can cook it all at the same time um, if you want a thicker piece and you're just going to cut thinner slices. But today we don't have that much time so I'm just going to put in about one third of it in my pan and then we can cook what we can uh, cook the rest later. All right so before I do that, I'm just going to give my powder a good toss. And I already smell it toasty, so I'm actually going to turn it off. Okay, so I'm going to just show you. It kind of turned into, it still looks pretty white, but it just turned a little bit more brown. And then to cool it down, you can stick it in the freezer, and it should cool down within five minutes. Okay, so this guy is ready. Okay. Um, there might be a little bit water in the bottom, doesn't matter. So this is a non-stick pan that I'm using. If you're using um, like a stainless steel, you might want to put a little bit of uh, oil down. But honestly, if you cool it per properly, you don't need oil because it just kind of comes out like a big sheet later. Um, and hopefully I can show you that. All right, so I'm just going to put in about one third to coat the bottom. And what it should be should be about one centimeter thick. Um, for us to make the mochi balls. And if you're going to not stuff it, um, you can actually pour the whole thing in. And the steaming would be about 30 minutes if this whole thing goes into the pan. And um, it should kind of just shape like jello. And if you put a piece of, um, um, uh, what is that called? Toothpick in, and it should come out um, without any matcha latte on it, right? So no liquid, um, and then should be done cooking. Okay, now I'm gonna 
close this guy and turn it back on to boiling. And we are going to time it. Get my trusty timer on. Where's my timer? Oh, over here. For about 10 minutes because it's only one centimeter thick. Okay, if it's thicker, then you would be doubling it or even thicker than be tripling it, okay? Um, so be careful also if you're cooking it for longer that you have enough water in the pot for it to boil so it doesn't boil the pot dry. All right, so 10 minutes, I'm gonna wait for that guy to cook. So if you're making more you, and you have one of the st tiered steamers, you can do three layers of one centimeter each and it'll all cook in about 10 to 15 minutes is a little bit longer time because there's three layers to go. Um, this batter you can save for about two days and make sure if you're cooking it, you uh, would whisk up all the uh, different, the flours that have been settled down and then you can just cook it again. Okay, great. So make sure you also cover it in the fridge so no water has escaped. You just put it in a jug and, and then just pour it in here. Okay, what else are we going to do? So the timer is going. I'm now going to talk about the filling. And I said that I don't like to buy my sesame roasted, so I'm going to go ahead and roast my sesame or, or toast my sesame in a um, uh, pan like this one. Turn it on to medium. And your house is going to smell Super amazing. I love the smell of toasted sesame and it's it's kind of um, very exciting to see that your sesame jumps when the pan is hot. So that's kind of cute. Um, but what you want to know is with black sesame, you don't know when it's toasted because it's dark, right? So you have to kind of smell it. Um, see that the outside of the sesame has gotten a little uh, layer of like oil on top and that means the cell walls have broken and the oil of the sesame has leached out and that should be enough to know that the black sesame has been toasted and it's ready to make sesame paste. Um, so that we're going to put on at about medium, medium high and you want to kind of shake it every five minutes and you'll know. Now we're going to do the bean paste. So bean paste is a big deal in Asia. You'll, you'll have like red bean soup, you'll have red bean paste stuffed in like uh, deep fried um, sesame balls, you'll have uh, red beans on ice cream, red bean ice cream. So beans are not uh, a dessert item in the Western world, but in Asia it's humongous. And um, I'm going to use black beans today because it was just a lot easier for me to find. I have like anxiety going to the uh, grocery store. I don't know if anybody shares that same thought of going to the grocery store lately because I love to like watch, I mean, you know, watch people and also look at the things that I'm buying and, uh, you know, read labels because. I'm a registered dietitian and I like to go know what's going on in all the foods that I buy and um, people don't like it that you're slowing the, the flow down. Um, so it's kind of ex excitingly anxious. I guess that would be a word for me to be using now. Okay, so the black bean is opened. Then the liquid you do want to drain. You don't really need to wash it out because a little bit of liquid is good because we're making a paste, right? Okay, so just drain out the top layer and keep a little bit in. I have a handheld blender. If you have a magic bullet, go ahead and get that. Or you can go grab a food processor. Um, if you don't have anything like that, you can actually just get a uh, potato masher and just start mashing your beans with um, some sugar if you want to add sugar or syrup if you want to add syrup. Well, obviously, I don't have any of that here at the True Nash Kitchen because we're all about not using any sugar. I'm going to blend in some dates or actually I have um, a really ripe pear 
then I'm going to be blending in. One thing that's different if you're using dates, you don't have to um, add more liquid. If you're using a pear, it's actually, well, you do have to add a little bit more liquid sour with dry fruits because there's no moisture in here. But with um, a really ripe apple or um, pear, there's extra liquid in here, so you might not need to add that extra liquid. So you, for each type of fruits that you're going to use, just make sure that the paste is um, not too watery. So I'm, because because I'm using the pear, so I'm just going to drain out a little bit more liquid. Okay. Okay. So because of time, I'm only going to use half a jar of beans today, and then you can save the half a jar for later. Um, but if you're making a lot of mochi for a lot of friends or family, then you can use the whole can. And the paste, you can freeze it or you can put it in the fridge for later. It kind of lasts, if you're putting it in the fridge, it lasts one or two days. If you're freezing it, it lasts a whole few months. So. Um, that's the good thing about um, the filling and then you can just thaw it and use it as the filling again or you can just cook it and make like bean soup with it too, right? Um, so here we are with hair. I'm just going to cut the uh, flesh off the pear and we're going to toss the core and I'm using a Bartlett bear pear. If you have anything else, go ahead and do it. I said apples are fine. Um, you can use a pineapple if you like to too. I'm just gonna chop it all small to be nicer to my um, blender. And for fruits, you do wanna use quite a ripe fruit or else it's not gonna be sweet at all, right? So uh, that's it. That's really the filling. Um, if you want to add a little pinch of uh, salt, so salt actually draws out the sweetness of anything that you're making. I'm just going to use a little pinch of like a Himalayan pink salt that I can find really anywhere right now. Um, I'm not talking like a whole teaspoon. I'm just talking about a little pinch. Okay, great. Put that away. And my trusty handheld blender that I love, had this for about five years, and I'm going to use it to enough beans you can go ahead and put in a scoop of coconut oil and put it in the fridge for about 10 minutes and the coconut oil will harden and the paste will harden as well okay so coconut oil for those who are vegan and you can put butter for those who aren't just going to blend that again really quickly because coconut oil melts really quick, oops. And, but then we're actually just gonna stick it in. Okay, that's done. It's a little bit thicker now, but it's going to get even more thick if we put it in the fridge or the freezer for just about 10 minutes, okay? I'm gonna be right back. Rinse off my Whoop. and I just rinsed off the head of the blender because we're going to use it again for the black sesame. Done with this guy. And my timer just went off. I don't know if you guys heard. 
We're also going to put this away because we don't need this. I'm just going to wipe my knife because I only just used it for a pair. Okay, so the timer has gone off. The sesame has almost finished toasting. I'm going to turn this guy off and I'm going to turn it off. And I'm going to show you, well, I'm going to bring you closer to the, uh, to the uh, stove. And you can see the actual sesames popping. You see them dancing. Yep, you know, it's quite hot. Um, that means that the, um, the cell walls are breaking and the oils are leaching out of the sesame. And it's time to turn the... Um, turn the, uh, the stove a little bit lower so it doesn't burn. Okay. All right. So I think it's actually almost done because I smell really nice sesame. I'm going to turn it off and I'm also going to turn off my steamer. Make sure you have some protective gear. Open it. Woo! That is done. Okay. So also bring you guys closer to my stove and you can see that the whole thing is a lot greener right and when you shake it it's solid and if you poke it with a knife or a um, stick there shouldn't be any matcha latte on your knife and that is done and what we're going to do right now is to cover it with a film and put it in the freezer. So this, this part is actually interesting. So the freezer will cool it down super quick. Okay. And for our sake today, that's why we put it in the freezer, because I have still to teach you a yoga class after this. But if you have time um, in your hands, you would stick it in the fridge for about four hours or overnight. So at least four hours in the fridge. And if you don't have four hours in the freezer, but only for about, um, let's say, if it's this thin, don't stick it in the freezer for over 30 minutes. Um, usually about 10 to 5 minutes, 5 to 10 minutes. It should be quite hard, but make sure there is some plastic wrap that is on top of the mochi. And at this point, it's already really, really nice to touch like a Mochi should feel when you touch it at the store, okay? And then it's still really hot, so make sure you have some gloves. And you can see that it's all airtight right now, and it's great to poke because it's so cute and chewy. Um, yeah, so don't forget it in the freezer or else it's just going to turn really hard and you can't use it again. Oopsie. And then in the meantime, if you want to, you can cook the rest of it either on a plate like this. I have some that you can, this, this um, pie, plate actually fits perfectly in my steamer, which is pretty awesome. Oops, and I just demonstrated that. What you shouldn't do, okay, so this fits perfectly in it, and I'm just going to put in the rest of the matcha mochi, and we're just going to steam it for about another 10 minutes in here. And there we go. I used up all my um, batter and I don't have to worry about it 
we do have to remind myself to take the one out of the freezer. If I forget it, it's going to turn really hard, and you're not going to be able to uh, mold it into a matcha mochi ball later. Uh, matcha mochi ball, that's <laughs> a lot to say. All right, so we did the bean filling, and now we're going to do the black sesame filling. And we've done the toasted black sesame over here, like so. Just gonna cool it down by shaking it around. And for the black sesame, I have some dates as well as the coconut oil. You don't have to use coconut oil, you can use butter for this, but you do have to have some sort of fat. Um, you can also use like a drizzle of whatever oil, like avocado oil, uh, grapeseed oil. Those things are fine too. I just like coconut oil for this recipe per se is because it's got really nice um, coconut aroma and it hardens really nicely. So when I make it into a ball later, it's a lot easier. And um, I wouldn't really use coconut oil for anything else other than dessert except for maybe some like Thai cooking because it has that coconutty flavor. And a lot of Thai foods have coconut in it, so which is um, great. Okay, so dates also, another thing. There's a lot of different types of dates out there. Uh, there are medjool dates. This one in particular, it's called a deeplet nor dates. I use this type of dates specifically, mainly because um, there's more fiber around it. It's a lot smaller than the medjool date. You can see right here that um, it kind of looks like the size of your thumb. And there's also the medjool date, which is probably double the size. And that has a lot more sugar content. It's um, on the, um, it's a different type of species of date. So that one has more sugar. This one has a little bit less sugar. Well, it has significantly less sugar. That's why I'm using it. And then also it's smaller. Therefore, there's a lot more skin on it. And the skin usually has more antioxidants and more fiber, so that's why I use this type of dates, okay? Okay, so with coconut oil, sesame, and then also a little pinch of salt, again, and these are the four ingredients that I'm gonna use in my um, sesame paste. So, you can get another container to blend this in, or you can also just put it in a magic bullet. Actually, so this is actually not a good idea for my handheld blender because it's actually small. I'm going to use a small, like a thinner. So let me check on the black bean, and I'm actually going to switch out the black bean container and use this for the sesame. So you can see the black bean is already hardened because of the um, coconut oil, so it's easy for me to just take it out and reuse this guy for the black sesame. I didn't want to embarrass myself if you guys saw me use the... That help blender with a bigger um, pan like that because I think it's just going to go everywhere. Okay, so this is probably going to be easier for the black beans to cool down. I'm going to stick this back into the freezer and rinse this guy out, and we're just going to blend black sesame paste in here. Out. 
and the black sesame can go in here. Perfect. Now I'm going to add in about eight dates. So this black sesame was about half, uh, a cup of black sesame. And then I'm going to add about one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight dates in here. It depends on how sweet you want the paste to be. Don't go overboard. Also, a little pinch of salt. So I have about a quarter teaspoon, actually even less, an eighth of a teaspoon of salt. Once again, the salt brings out the sweetness of your foods, so you don't need to add so much sugar. And then I'm going to add a big heaping, so this is probably about two tablespoons of coconut. Do you guys have a um, favorite shop to go buy things at? Are you guys all in Vancouver, Richmond, Burnaby area? I go to Burnaby a lot because my uh, production kitchen is there. I make um, a line of gluten-free, plant-based, and no sugar added products. We have sauces, you can see behind me, we have a gluten-free, oh, well, all gluten-free, but we have a, a vegan oyster sauce, a vegan hoisin sauce, and a vegan black bean sauce. We also have drinks, we have the fig lemonade, as well as a cranberry cider. And then we also do four hot sauces. So those of you who like spicy, can take a look at my hot sauce line. And um, they're all different flavors and they're all different beautiful colors because I love to play with the colors of fruits and vegetables. Okay, so now we're all secure. really good when you're blending it. Okay, so I may need to help it out with a little bit of a spoonage action, but I can see that it's already working. Right. And you can also come say hi whenever I'm at a farmer's market. So we're part of the Coquitlam Farmer's Market as well as the UBC. Um, I know Clayton Farmer's Market in Langley is about to open in June. They already have an online store, Clayton Farmer's Market, as well as the uh, Fort Langley Vegan Market. I think this weekend is their last weekend before you can order online and you can pick up at their Fort Langley location. Okay. And then our, also our website. <laughs> made a really nice paste and if you stick it in the fridge it'll harden really nicely. It's already really um, great for our filling because it's quite um, solid in texture but we want to make it a little bit harder so it's easier for us to make it into a ball and stuff it in our green tea mochi later. Awesome. All right. So that is finished. A little bit in with it. I'm going to show you the paste that we've made with the sesame. 
powder, I mean the sesame, black sesame. So it kind of looks like this. All right. And now you're going to stick it in the fridge and let the uh, coconut oil harden. And we can use it for the filling. Okay, so make sure you taste a little bit of the sesame because it's so good. Mmm, and it's um, great as a spread on toast as well as mixing it into your, well I have a little <laughs> sesame in my clip. So mix it into like a pudding or yogurt. It's just going to elevate whatever thing you're eating. Um, toast is actually the best bet, I would think. Okay, so I'm going to check out my other thing because it's already 10 minutes. I'm going to open it with a, where is my oven mitt? Over here. I'm going to show you what it's going to look like if you don't have enough time or you, you might not. This might be undercooked. Oh, actually, this is already done. It's so thin, right? So something like about a one centimeter thin takes only 10 minutes. So it's all done already. I'm just going to take it out again. But two minutes this time because this one is a bit of a different contraption. Okay. So pour off the excess water on top. And here we go, we have another mochi. And this one, if you have more time, you can put it in the fridge, I said at least four hours before you wanna to touch it, or overnight and touch it the next, uh, the next morning, and you can make lovely mochi cubes out of it, and um, stuff it also. So very important one more time is to cover this guy with a nice film of plastic. Or even just put a parchment paper on top. I think that would be great. But parchment paper does have some pores, so um, make sure that you'll use it, um, you know, within the next day or so. And if you don't cover it with a uh, piece of plastic or parchment paper, the outside of the top is going to form a really hard layer of skin and um, that's not very um, appealing or tasty at all. So this one I'm going to leave overnight and I'm going to make this in the morning. And that, um, people have asked me how long you can leave it in the fridge. Um, I'd say about two days before you want to start cutting it and molding it. But um, if it does get harder, you can actually just throw it on the steamer again, cook it for about 10 minutes if it's thin or, or about um, 30 minutes if it's thick, and it should get um, uh, springy uh, like this. And then you would just have to wait again in the freezer for like 20 minutes or in the fridge overnight again and use it after four hours or the next morning, okay? So our first mochi is now coming out of the uh, freezer. It's still a little bit warm. It feels a bit lukewarm. Um, this is the time that you can use it, but it would be nice if it was completely cooled down. Um, because we're doing a live section, I don't want you to get bored. We are going to teach you how to um, start cutting the mochi. All right, let's put this away. Thank you. 
Okay, so you want to make sure that you have your green tea powder with some glutinous rice powder. As I said, you don't have to mix it with glutinous rice powder. If you like it more of a subtle flavor, the glutinous rice powder would be good. If you like full on like matcha, then you can just use the matcha powder, okay? And then I have a little bit of a contraption here. So it is a, a tray with a lip so the powder doesn't get everywhere in your kitchen. And then I'm putting a cutting board inside the tray um, to prep um, my matcha from getting um, cut right now. So you want to take the plastic film off. You can reuse this for another mochi if you want to or something else later. It's good to reuse or else it just doesn't go onto the landfill. And then you want to use the powder and sprinkle on top and make sure it's all over because it's really sticky and you don't want to expose any part of the mochi. Okay, does anyone have any questions? Don't hesitate to write on the um, chat and we can, I can answer them if I see it or if I get a chance to do it before we do yoga. Okay, so I have the whole thing covered and right now you want to use your fingertips and kind of go underneath that mochi layer. Okay. So, in the meantime, I know this is not cool enough yet, but it still should come out pretty clean, okay? And then the more that you expose, the stickier it gets, so make sure you have powder to put on the bottom side. And as you tear off the mochi, you wanna have matcha powder, mochi powder, on the bottom, okay? So I'm really doing this very gently and trying to get as much of the mochi off of the plate as possible. This is a lot easier if you wait it a little bit longer in the fridge. Okay, so I'm just gonna slowly do this. Make sure you remember to breathe. Some people, when they do this, they hold their breath and then, yeah, it's not really So slowly, and if you just want to take out half at a time, go ahead. It's probably what I'm going to do to save us time so we have more time to do some yoga. And then you can come back to the kitchen after yoga to finish these mochi bells. Okay. So I have about three quarter, two quarters still on the pan. Um, it is a harder process if it's not yet cooled down enough. Maybe at the end of yoga, I'll show you what it should look like after about 30 minutes in the, in the freezer. Okay, so I only have half of it kind of out, as you can see. This is a very thin slice, and I can use my knife to just gently cut down to where I have lifted it off and kind of bring out the, the piece that I tore, tore off. And be careful, you don't want to rip it because there's no, not too much electricity on it, okay? So I still have half of it in my pan and you want to have a little bit of flour on the bottom, okay? And now you want to separate the top and the bottom. So the top part is the like the, the nicer, more beautiful, more smooth part, okay? And you actually wanna turn that upside down, okay? So you're gonna put your filling on this side, okay? So we have half the matcha, and you want to use your knife, so a little bit of flour goes more, so then when you're cutting into it, your knife kind of drags powder into wherever it cuts, right? And it really depends on how big you want the balls to be. I want it to be more of like a mouth-sized piece. You can 
cut it bigger if you want it to be like a two bite mochi. So um, if you want to measure sort of like a, a little bit with your thumb to um, see how many you want to cut. So I'm going to probably cut about four out of this guy. So if it's a, a, a square, it's going to be a lot easier. I chose a round one because it fits in here. If you have a smaller square baking pan, go ahead and use that too. Um, okay, so as a bite size one, I can cut four. So which means I'm going to cut in the middle. Okay, and then now that it's kind of in a triangle, I'm going to cut like pizza slices off of this to help me make the matcha mochi more geometrical. Okay, so now after we cut it, we can kind of just shake off the excess powder off of the mochi. And then we're going to go to the fridge and check out our filling. And you're going to use whichever filling that is hardened the most. And then you're also going to get a nice plate so you can put your finished product on, right? So let me get the plate first. Just a nice white plate would work really well, I think. And then we're going to grab, I'm thinking the, the sesame is faster. And I am right, because it was already pretty solidified when we put it in the fridge. So it's kind of already in a solidified um, texture. Then you want to get a spoon also. So when you're putting your filling in, you want to have it more of a round shape already. So because this is black, you don't want to touch it so much because you don't want the outside of your mochi to be too dark. Okay, so you're going to shape that into a ball, and then you're going to put it in the middle of your sheet. So I'm going to just get some paper to help me out with cleaning. So there's one. I'm just going to do um, all of these guys in black sesame. So, okay, you can even like roll it into a ball with your palms, stick it into the largest diameter or like the, the fattest part of your mochi slice. Okay, and don't be over zealous or gluttonous with your filling because you don't want any of it to be escaping out of your nice um, envelope, I guess, you or wrapper that you've created. Okay, so one more. So we have four here. This one. I'm going to roll that into the bowl. Okay, so now I have one, two, three, four, and I'm ready to wrap. So make sure when you're wrapping, you don't have any black marks in your hand because you, you want it to look as pretty as possible. Um, and then you're just going to slowly fold it over if it's in a circle, okay? So there's still some exposed edges, and what you're going to do is to put those exposed edges together and squeeze and, and, and leave the top part or the nice part intact, and you just wanna squeeze the exposed parts into a ball like this. Okay, I'm going to do one, and I'm going to do one up close so everybody can see. So the bottom looks like this, and you don't expose it, but you're just squeezing the edges together. Okay, and if it does get sticky, you want to grab a little bit of flour and help your stickiness situation, and then pat it dry, and then you're going to turn the ball over to expose the pretty side. And then you're just going to gently kind of coddle it to make a nice round mochi ball like that. And if there's any rough patches or, or any exposed 
mochi, just put some powder on it. And here's our first matcha ball. Okay, so we put that on the plate. And I'm gonna do the next few. Once more, you grab the that end. And then you can actually just roll it like this and present it like this. There's nothing wrong with it, it's kind of cute. But we're making balls, right? So right now, I have a roll like this. I'm gonna bring this over top and then squeeze it together. And then the outsides also squeeze it with the edge that I brought in together. And you do wanna do this gently because it is a very thin mochi and just you want to squeeze the um, mochi together and all the rough edges is going to be on the very bottom of your ball and when you present it to your friends or family when you eat it later you won't have a problem with it so Again, the ugly part is on the bottom. And then if you have a lot of exposed stickiness, you can just uh, grab some powder and pat it down. And then at the end, turn it over and then start coddling it and make it into a ball. And add some extra powder. Okay, so here's another ball that we've just created. Beautiful, right? Let me just add it to here. And then if you have any muffin um, liners, putting it in the muffin liners will be really pretty to present. So I'm gonna see if I can grab some muffin liners over here. From the back of my drawer. Totally forgot about this. Okay, so we have some muffin liners and I'm gonna just put some on the muffin liners and it'll be like just what you can get at the store, right? I like the white ones, so I'm going to tear the other colors away just to expose the white ones. Okay, so we have two mochi balls here. Do you guys want me to do one more and then we can go and do some yoga and then maybe we can come back and check on the black bean, um, or we can check on the black bean first and then come back to all right, so I'm gonna do the last two really quickly. I'm sure you're also doing this at home, right? Okay, so the more practice you have, the quicker this becomes. and you won't have to be fussing so much. But your hands do get dirty. Okay, so we're coddling it and then grabbing a muffin liner. Beautiful. Stick it in. Okay. There you go, there's four with the filling, and you just do the same thing with the bean, if you have red bean or, or black bean today. And as I said, you don't have to have filling, you can just cut it into slices or cubes and um, eat it with ice cream. Okay, here we go. Just finishing the last one. Let's get more muffin liners that are prettier. Okay. 
day. And voila. And here we have our mochi balls. Yay. All right. So let's wash your hands. And I'm going to take off my apron and then we're going to go do some yoga. Um, if you give me a 30 second break. And we're going to turn off the. All right, so follow me to get our workout on. Or if you guys want to take it slow, I'm gonna also get a little bit of um, variation so other people who have not done yoga before can come and take this class with me. Okay, so I just moved into this house that we have. So we have some, <sighs> pictures lying around. I'm just going to move that aside. Okay, so I already have my stretchy pants on and my yoga attire. If you guys want to go and change that out, get a yoga mat. If you want to grab some water, we can do so. And none of you have any questions for me about making matcha, so I will say that I did a good job. <laughs> just kidding. Um, okay, so I'm going to see if um, you guys need maybe like two minutes to get all your stuff ready. And we can start. I'm just going to get some music and turn it on. The music is in here, and hopefully you guys got your water, and we can start our yoga class. I hope that wasn't so stressful, the mochi making, and um, you can also review this video at any time on our Facebook page. And those who have donated, I want to thank you very much for helping a small business during this time. And if you want to play your own music, go ahead. I just need to find my soundtrack that I have created for you today. There we go. Um, and then we can start. So this is more of a, a relaxing vinyasa flow. I'm a certified yoga teacher in Vancouver and we usually do cooking classes and yoga together. Um, it's something that I love to share with you um, because I believe in cooking and eating well as well as letting it flow. So um, I paired yoga and cooking together just because I think it's something that is um, that really drives my spirit and motivates me to do the things that I do. And um, I'm sure a lot of you also have your um, practices and motivation that keeps you going and stay positive during this time. Okay, so I set my phone to play some background music. And if you don't like it, play your own. Um, and let's start by doing some breathing exercises. Okay. I'm going to ask you guys to stand straight with your feet around hip width distance and shoulders are down. You can bring them up to your ears and slowly bring them down and close your eyes. Take in a deep inhale through your nose and let it hit the back of your throat. Come down into your chest, allow it to open up and slowly have it travel all the way down into your belly. Let it expand, hold it there 
and exhale all the way up and up through your nose. One more time, inhale, one, two, three, four, and hold. And then four, three, two, one, and exhale it all out. One more time, inhale, one, two, three, four, hold it in your belly. And exhale, four, three, two, one. And in your own time, do another inhale deep. Make sure it covers all your insides and covering the back of your throat. Come down, feel your chest, let it hit the bottom of your belly. Make sure you hold it a little bit before you exhale. Okay. On your next inhale, I'm gonna ask you to open up your arms and bring them to the sky. Clasp it, sending your forefingers towards the ceiling. And then you're gonna step your foot together, feet together. And lift your toes up and then ground them down into your mat. And slowly inhale to the right side of the room. Bring your shoulders down and your elbows are straight, trying to be as close to your earlobes as possible. And you're going to point your fingers towards the left side of the room. And slowly come back to the middle, exhale. Another inhale, reach an inch taller and come to the opposite side. Keeping your belly tucked in and your butt tucked in, try to be as straight as possible, but not locking your joints. And inhale, back to center. Unravel your arms, slowly bring it down to your side. Inhale your shoulders up towards your ears and rolling down, exhale. One more time, inhale your shoulders towards your ears and roll them to the back and send it down. Slowly bring your arms up over your head. Bring them together into a prayer pose and slowly let it come down to heart center. Pause here for one second and see if we can come back to our breaths. Inhale, one, two, three, four, and hold. And exhale, four, three, two, one. Let your arms go. Bring it up again, all the way up. And slowly lean forward, bend from your hips, keep your back straight. And you're gonna hinge down. Slowly unravel your arms, step your feet at hip width distance. And you're gonna see if you can relax your neck. And if you touch the floor, great, if you don't, you can hold your opposite elbows and let your body sway back and forth. And inhale, one vertebrae at a time, flat back halfway. Keep your back straight and you're just gonna look about one foot ahead of the mat. And exhale it down again, forward fold. Slowly walk your palms towards the front of the mat, bend your knees, and you can walk your foot back into a plank position. Keep your abs tucked in, your legs are straight, your arms are webbed and flat underneath your shoulders. And slowly bend your arms, exhale it all the way down towards the mat. 
If you can't plank, just put your knees down, untuck your toes, inhale your head up into a mini cobra, and exhale it down. Inhale up again to mini cobra, tuck your toes in, push yourself up into a downward facing dog. Inhale your ankles towards the ceiling and exhale it down. Look towards your belly button. Inhale, look in front of you. Slowly bend your knees. You can walk towards the front of your mat. And straighten your legs and hang low. Inhale, stand all the way up and into mountain pose. So in mountain pose, your shoulders are down, your legs are a little bit apart about with hip width distance. Your hands are, and your, face, your palms are facing towards the front. And slowly inhale all the way up, your arms come above your head, and bring them towards prayer. You're going to pivot your left leg out, either put it on your ankle, keep your hip, hips tucked under and your belly slept in. You can bring it towards your shins if you can. And those of you who want to bring it higher can go all the way up towards your thighs and press into your thigh and slowly. So if you want to come back down here, keep your balance. And look at a point in front of you, and slowly your arms come up towards the ceiling. You're growing the tree. See if you can inhale one more inch and trying to touch the sky. Make sure your feet is not on your knees. Stay here, one more deep breath up, stretch one more inch further, and slowly bring your arms back to center, pivot your legs towards me, and pull it down, and shake it all out. Inhale all the way up again, bring your arms towards heart center, pivot the opposite leg out, you can rest it on your ankle, bring it towards your knee or in your thigh, and pick a point to look at, so you you don't lose your concentration. Inhale, bring your arms above your head, open them up above your head. Inhale, see if you can come out of your hip bones, stretch your fingertips a little bit higher. Keep breathing deep. And bring your arms back down. Palms to heart center. Pivot your feet towards the knee and slow it down. Inhale all the way up. Inhale. Clasp your arms and slow it down. Heart center. I want you to spread your legs about uh, two lengths of your hips. So just a little bit further and you're comfortable. Keep your arms at heart center. And you can slowly hinge at your hips, bring your hands down into the front, let your head hang, and slowly bring your left leg, keep your right leg straight and walk your hands towards the bent leg, keep your right leg straight. Try looking about a foot ahead of you, keep your back straight. Deep inhale, and exhale, walk towards the other side. Bend your right leg, keep your left leg straight. Look ahead of you, keep your back straight, your belly tucked in. Inhale, and exhale back to center. Relax your neck. And wiggle it yes and no. And slowly 
pivot your feet, feet back towards hip width distance and let your body hang forward fold. Inhale, come up halfway, your back is straight, just look a little bit above your mat and exhale it down. Slowly plant your arms, uh, your palms out in front of you, underneath your shoulders, and you're, we're going to walk back into a plank position. If this is hard for you, come down to your knees, okay? So in plank, lift out of your shoulders a little bit, and slowly come down, bend your arms, chaturanga. Send your toes back and slowly push up into a cobra or you can come into an up dog where it means that you're lifting off your knees and then you're going to push yourself into a downward facing dog where you inhale your ankles up towards the ceiling and then you bring them down then you're going to inhale and bring your left leg and you're going to bring it towards the ceiling. You're going to flex your ankles and point your toes. Slowly bend your knee, bring it towards the middle and then step it through in between your palms. Your back foot pivots down into a 45 degree angle and slowly using your abs, come up to warrior one. Make sure your knees are about a 90 degree angle above your ankles. Your hips are facing straight and your arms are stretching up towards the ceiling. And then you want to slowly bring your arms down by flexing them all the way down, raising your side of your body, bring it up above your side torso. And when you get to your chest, you wanna push any bad air out in front of you. Inhale, send your ankles and your fingers pointing down, bring your arms up, and you're gonna flex your ankles, point your fingers up and your arms come down. Inhale, bring your arms up along the side of your torso at your chest, push it out. Inhale, up above the sky and flex your wrists and bring it all down one more time. Inhale, raising your side torso and exhale, push. Inhale, arms above your head, and slowly bring it back to our heart center. And you're gonna open up your arms wide, and then you're gonna pivot your back feet, come into warrior two. See if you can bend a little bit lower. Your arms are stretched out straight. Inhale, your front arm comes up into exalted warrior, back arm down, or you can send it around, see if you can touch your front thigh. Exhale, back to warrior two, and you're going to windmill your arms down, plant it on the floor, step your leg back into a plank position, come down chaturanga, flow and tuck your toes, cobra or up dog, and back to downward facing dog. Take a deep breath in here, bring your ankles towards the sky, and exhale it down. This time, straighten your left, right leg, point it towards the sky, flex and point, flex and point, Bend your knee and step it through in between your palms. And secure your back foot into a 45 degree angle pivot. And slowly with your abs, come up. Sending your arms towards the sky. 
Your front knees at for a 90 degree angle. Tuck in your belly. Send your hips towards the front of the room. And slowly, we're gonna flex our wrists and bring the hands, arms down along the side of your body. Send the arms above, up, come up in your torso when you get to your chest. Push any negative energy away. Point your fingers down, bring them towards the ceiling. And again, flex your wrists, bring your arms down, point it down now. Inhale, bring your arms up at your chest. Exhale, push. Inhale one more time, above the sky. Flex your wrists, bring your hands down. And bring your arms up your torso. And at your chest, push the air away. Inhale above your arms. And come down into heart center. I'm gonna swing your arms out into warrior two. Pivot your back foot so it's parallel to the mat. Bring your stance just a little bit wider. And see if you can sit a little bit lower. Glance out through your middle finger. Inhale, front arm up, back arm down. And come back to warrior two. Slowly bring your arms windmill down, press it down in front of your mat, and step your leg back into plank. And bring your arms chaturanga. Send your feet pointing back, either come up to cobra, or you can come to up dog and send yourself back to downward facing dog. And inhale your ankles up and exhale it low. Slowly look in front of your mat and you can walk towards your palms and send your neck down. And exhale forward fold. And inhale, come up one vertebrae at a time till you're standing. Inhale your shoulders towards your ears and bring it back down and slowly exhale. Inhale your arms above your head and you want to separate your arms. Make sure left goes underneath your right into an eagle twist or you can just give yourself a nice hug. And then bring your left leg over. So whichever leg is over, then the other arm is under. Slowly tuck your belly in and see if you can come down a little bit lower and send your elbows a little bit higher. Keep a distance and gaze in front of a focus point to keep your balance. And slowly stand up straight and ravel your legs and ravel your arms and shake it out. Inhale, arms above your head. And then the opposite arm, which is the right underneath. The opposite leg crosses over, tuck in your tailbone and your belly. Slowly sit down into a chair and bring your elbows towards the ceiling. Deep inhale, so you can sit down just a little bit lower. Bring your elbows just a little higher. And exhale, stand up straight and ravel your legs and ravel your arms and shake it out. And inhale one more time above your head. Bring it to prayer, bring it towards your heart. Taking a deep inhale, one, two, three, Four, hold, 
and exhale for three, two, one. Exhale, your arms come towards your side. Step your feet about hip width distance and slowly tucking your tailbone and your belly. Sit down into your chair, bring your arms out in front of you and balance. Inhale, see if you can sit one more inch further down. Bring your arms just a little bit higher and see if you can plant at your fingertips. And slowly bring your arms down, your, hand, your legs are straight. Forward fold. Inhale, flat back, halfway up, press ahead of you, and exhale it down. And today we're going to spread our feet and make sure that it's about 45 degree angle pointing. We're going to do some yogi squats, like a balasana. All right, make sure that you are balanced and you have your arms right where your knees are and then you can help it kind of stretch out by pressing your knees outward and sending your tailbone down keeping your back straight and your neck is lengthened keep breathing here this is a great hip opener And slowly let go of your arms, plant them down, pivot your feet together, forward fold. And then you can bend your legs again, bring your arms at prayer, and twist towards the right side, hook your elbow towards the outside of your knee, and look towards the ceiling. Open up your arms, stretch them towards the sky and point one down, and slowly bring it back to center. Inhale up and come back down to chair. Hook the other side, look towards the ceiling, and open up your arms if you can. Slowly bring your palms back together and forward fold. And we're going to plant our palms down, step back into a plank again, bring yourself all the way down towards your mat, stretch your legs back, and you're going to bring your arms back also, see if you can clasp your hands behind your back, send your legs together, and lift your torso and your legs towards the ceiling. Inhale and exhale, release. And slowly bring your cheek on towards your right side. Take in a few deep inhales. And do this one more time. Bring your head towards the middle. Pass your fingers behind your back. Lift it up. And bring your toes together and send your torso and your feet towards the ceiling. Inhale. And exhale. Turn your cheek towards the opposite side. And relax. Your next inhale, bend your legs and see if you can grab hold of your ankles from the outside and take an inhale and exhale it, kicking towards the ceiling, lift your head up and looking up straight. 
and slowly exhale it down, let it go. Bring your arms underneath your shoulders and you're gonna walk yourself up into a tabletop position. And slowly, you're gonna come into a seated pose. Send your right leg, left leg for you out straight. Bring your opposite leg around. Give it a good hug. And hook your left arm over and see if you can turn your head towards the back of the room. Come back to center. Your other leg stretches out. The right leg goes across your body. Keep your back straight and hook your left right arm over your right, your left. Oh my gosh. Yes. <laughs> and then slowly you turn your torso around and look towards the back of the room, keeping your back straight. And slowly come back to center and bring your legs straight out. Kind of lift your butt out of your backbone and flex your toes. See if you can lift your arms above your head with an inhale and slowly see if you can touch your toes. If you can't, bring your arms towards your shin. Just keep your back straight and slowly come down. You can see you can come as low as you can. Rest your neck. And we're gonna bring our legs in. You can either cross them or you can bring them into a butterfly position. And we're gonna just do one last set of breaths together. So exhale everything out of your lungs. Keep your shoulders down and inhale through your nose. One, two, three, four, hold it. And four, three, two, and one. And inhale one more time at your own pace. And we're gonna let it out slowly. And this is my Tomasa flow for today. And I hope you enjoyed class. And I hope you guys had fun making mochi with me. And maybe we'll see you again at one of our Zoom classes during the week or Sundays. We're usually on Facebook Live, so we can see you there. And check us out on trunash.com. Namaste. And I wish you a wonderful, long weekend. Whew, I am so hot. And if you guys want to stay with me, we can just kind of go look at our mochi again and our, our red bean paste, black bean paste. Oh, okay. Um, and I hope you guys... Um, Got everything down. Let me see the red bean, black bean paste. Ooh. And this is very, very hard. So it's perfect for a paste filling and we're just gonna do exactly the same as we did with our regular mochi. Um, so I hope you guys had fun and we'll see you hopefully next week. All right, thank you everyone. And make sure if you have any more questions, you can email me info at trunoff.com or send me a message on Facebook. All right, see ya.